All right, everyone, welcome back to the podcast. This is your host, as always, Jason Lee. And today, I've got a guest that actually interviewed me on his podcast, The Wake Up Call. It's a great show. If you haven't seen it, make sure you check it out and take a listen. It's on all podcast platforms. But Paul, thanks for coming on today. How are you doing? Doing great, Jason. Thanks for having me. Super excited about talking shop. Yeah. First question for you. If you were in the elevator with someone and you had one minute to tell them what you do and who you are, how would you mm -hmm. say that? I help uh, people with lazy money earn a above average return uh, by investing in real estate. Nice. And how long have you been in real estate for? About eight years. I used it as a way to get out of my day job and I keep um, kind of climbing up the uh, real estate ladder where I'm uh, less involved in the assets and more involved in the, in the debt and the, and the funding of projects. Got it. Got it. And then before you got into real estate, you said you used it to get out of your corporate job. What, 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 what career were you in before you got into real estate? Yeah, I was a uh, computer engineer by training and worked for an internet service provider and we helped uh, make our little corner of the internet work. And uh, uh, I live and operate in Little Rock, Arkansas, and that's where that company was, or and still is headquartered. And when I worked for them, I was uh, a director of, of the engineering um, department. And, you know, not an all bad job, but there's just a lot of corporate politics. Got it. And how long were you in that job for? I was in that in industry that for 17 years and at that, at that company for nine years. Got it. So after 17 years, you had enough. You were, you were done. Yeah. I was 15 years into my career and I had a wake up call moment and I just realized that they don't really care about me. And it is not if, but when I'm going to be the, one of the people getting laid off instead of one of the people who was having to tell the bad story to lay somebody off. And uh, I was about two years into my three year plan to escape when I was laid off. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it. And can you tell us more about that wake up call? Like what triggered it? And was there mm -hmm. a moment in time where you're like, man, I got to do something else and do my own thing. Or what was mm -hmm. that? There was a very specific moment. Uh, it was in 2014. I was on a beach vacation where my wife and I and children would uh, go to the Gulf Shores, Alabama, which is the closest white sandy beach. If you live in the, the Southeast, that's where a lot of people go. They call it the Redneck Riviera. And yeah, I'm pretty much a redneck and from the South and that's where we go for the, <laughs> for the summer. Um, and we had a great time. And the house that we stayed at for a week became vacant, became available because somebody had a cancellation. So we had the option that gave us the option to extend that vacation. So I had the money. My wife was a stay at home mom. So her schedule was open. My kids were out because they were on summer break and all we had to check to make sure that I could do is stay and, and work from the beach, which I normally worked for in, in like on conference calls all day anyway. So what's the big deal? Called my boss up just to make sure everything was okay. And he just very uh, matter of factly said, you, you want to work from the beach? <laughs> we don't do that here. I expect you in your office at 8 a.m. Click. And I was like, okay. I guess that's not, was not a conversation. And, and, um, I had no other choice, but to pack up and drive home 10 hours, uh, mad and pissed. And I remember that in the moment was when I was driving home, I'd packed up the, uh, the bags in the van playing Tetris, you know, how you do, you get everything packed up and I still had sand all over me, <laughs> uh, driving off. And I looked in the rearview mirror and my kids were, uh, kind of slumped over and kind of resigned to their fate. And that moment made me feel so small and insignificant that I was, did not have the sovereignty, did not have the personal freedom to spend more time with my family. And I swore at that moment that I would never, ever ask permission to spend more time with my family again. I, I switched the narrative where I was going to control when I spent time with my family and I would ask their permission if I could go work. Mm, wow. That's a powerful moment. When that happened to you, were you already invested in real estate or were you not invested in real estate yet? I wasn't. No, I had nothing. I mean, I had no equity other than some stocks that I had purchased in my 401k and IRA 
So I had I had some money in those accounts, you know, probably enough to you know three or four hundred thousand dollars at the time, you know, enough to do something with. But those accounts are kind of tough to tap into without taxes or penalties. And there's all kinds of clever angles you can take to you know do a rollover business startup or something. But I just didn't feel like it was the right move to just liquidate my my retirement and just quit. So I wanted to find an alternative path. And I've spent a, a good year looking for different options. I considered buying a franchise. I considered starting an insurance agency. I was trying to think of some sort of business I could run. And all of those things, I felt like I was going to be buying myself another job. So I'd just be jumping from the, from the firing pan right into the fire. Now, I wanted something where I owned the equity of it, where, I, where uh, it could work for me versus me having to work for it. And I, I discovered, well, you know, how about I just buy... A rental property. I bought one single family rental property here in Little Rock the following summer. And let's just see if I can see if that works. And you know, that was in 2015. And once I bought that first one, I kind of got hooked and I just went on a tear buying a bunch of single families. Nice. So you did a lot of due diligence before you got into real estate. You were seeing every avenue possible to try to find the best way to get out of your current current career. Yeah, it took me a little while to to land on real estate as the new path for me. And I, I'm not a religious or dogmatic person about uh, which asset class is the best. I think you pick the asset class that makes sense for your skill set and the current market cycle and kind of what makes sense for you and kind of where you live matters too. And I just didn't have any good ideas. I just, I, I thought, well, like one thing I can figure out is how much does a property rent for? You know, if I figure out, I'm smart enough to figure that part out. And let me figure out how I can actually value a property and let me figure out what it takes to fix a property up. And I realized very quickly that I, I have no business fixing up properties myself. I need to hire that out. I'm not handy. Don't want to be handy. Uh, I, I want to, <laughs> that's not why I got into this is to be a handyman. Uh, so <laughs> I, I looked into, you know, how could I like buy little small businesses? And that's what I felt like little, little, those little houses were, were little small businesses. Mm. Did you have a mentor or someone that taught you the business? Great question, because I have a really good story about the first mentor that I had. So as is often the advice when you listen to people, like, hey, if I want to get started, you know, go find a mentor, go find someone who's done this before you. But, you know, they're either expensive or they're they're quacks or you just or you just don't know. You just can't get access. Right. So I found a guy on the Internet that was in another market about an hour from me in Little Rock. So he was in, in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And I, I emailed him up from his website. I found his email and said, hey, I'm looking to do this. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, a, you know, I'm in the corporate world, but I want to branch out and use real estate as an angle. I don't want to compete with you because we're in different markets, but I do need some help learning the business. Is there anything that you offer as far as mentorship? I'll be happy to exchange time um, for it help you in your business some way. And he emailed me, or he called me back about two weeks later and said, uh, yeah, I, I do offer a mentorship. Um, and all you got to do is uh, go and buy the book, The Richest Man in Babylon, uh, write a three page handwritten essay and then mail the book that you've made notes in and the essay to my P.O. box. And once you do that, I'll know you're serious. And that was his like mixed Mr. Miyagi wax on wax off uh, <laughs> moment um, where he um, like that was his measure of, I mean, he never, he never charged anything. He, he, you know, it wasn't any kind of, uh, you know, true mentorship where I had to pay some sort of fee. His fee was making me work. And I think over the next two or three years, I probably wrote something like nine or 10 essays on several books that he w would recommend to me. Wow. That's amazing. Who, um, who was that person? There's a guy uh, named uh, Jim Banning. Uh, he's in um, in Hot Springs, and um, it was like I think a year or so into knowing him that we even met face to face. We actually met face to face for the first time in, in Las Vegas. We went to some sort of um, conference. Uh, so, um, but he would just shoot me these these assignments and say, "Hey, um, write write." And one, I had a big lesson. I had a big moment. I was two or three books into it and we started actually doing real estate books. And I can't remember what book it was, but a part of my answer is I was writing with ego. Like I, I would type it all out and then I would physically handwrite it because that was his requirement. You had to handwrite it. 
And in that writing, handwriting, it, it makes you think about what you're saying in a different way. And I could just kind of feel myself kind of puffing my chest out saying, you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I have a $150 million budget at work and I have a, a master's in business and blah, blah, blah. All this, this ego was just pouring out of me. And I kind of had to realize uh, that was another kind of a mini wake up call moment. It was like, you jackass, um, you are an absolute newbie in this business. And what you've done in the corporate world is completely irrelevant. Like you need to take a little uh, a piece of humble pie and learn some stuff and stop trying to talk, talk about how, how good you are at something and figure out what you're not good at. And that was a kind of a big learning moment for me. Wow. That's amazing. What book you think, um, challenged your beliefs or impacted you the most? Uh, I did read a book that wasn't assigned to me, uh, by, by Jim, but was, uh, called the, um, the, the, the big leap by Gay Hendricks. And he has this concept of, uh, you, we self-sabotage ourselves. We have this kind of ceiling of success that we allow ourselves subconsciously. And you, in order to make the big leap, you have to kind of consciously become aware that you are self-sabotaging yourself. And I was, I was definitely doing that. I was, I had a, a, an employee's mentality and I wanted things to happen just because I was working hard not because I was actually getting results. That's a very employee's mindset. You're like, I'm working hard, so pay me. That's not the way it works in business. Like the, the market does not care one bit. And really when it boils down to it, employees, employers don't care if you're working hard, they want results. But it's that, that lesson gets lost in the corporate world and a lot of jobs that you have. But when you're the CEO of your solopreneur business, you, you know, all that stuff goes aside, like you need results. And I realized that I was limiting myself. Like I had this idea, I would, I would look at my bank account, like, oh, I have a hundred thousand dollars there. Like I'm, I'm doing well, great. And I would take off the pressure. Like I, I would stop pushing and I had to make some adjustments in how I manage business and look at my business through some key performance indicators based on some goals I've set instead of the uh, latent or, and, and outcome that came on later that was just a, a dollar amount in, in your bank account. It's kind of an irrelevant deal because you don't really want money. You want what money can do for you. It, and I was, and, and that took me a while to learn that lesson. Mm, that's fantastic. How do you think you used to self-sabotage yourself when you first started or were in the corporate world? I would um, take shortcuts or I would try and do the least amount of work possible to get the most output, which sounds like a good idea. But in reality, what you end up doing is you end up becoming the guy who can do uh like in the mar in martial arts can do every move once, but that's not who you really should be afraid of. You should be afraid of the guy who's done the, who's done a thousand kicks. There's one kick a thousand times versus another guy who's done all the kicks once, right? Like I didn't find a specialty. And so I would dabble and I would chase rabbits and I would have shiny object syndrome. And I didn't become an expert in something that somebody was willing to pay for, for a long time into the process. Mm. I hope you're enjoying the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I hope you're getting value out of it. If you don't mind doing me a quick favor, if you could leave me a five-star review and subscribe to my channel or the podcast, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm trying to reach more amazing people like yourself on the world of real estate so that you can get out of the system and live the passive income lifestyle and do what you want whenever you want. So if you could share this video with your friends, whether it's whether you're watching on YouTube or sharing the podcast link, I greatly appreciate it. If you can help grow the show so I can reach more amazing people, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. So that takes me to my next question. What is your specialty in real estate right now? What asset class do you specialize in? Right. So I've switched from single family and now I'm doing commercial real estate and I'm uh, big on multifamily. So we, we build and develop multifamily projects. Uh, as, and that's what I do as a GP. Then I also have a, a fund where I lend to other projects. So I like raising capital. That's basically what I like doing. So whether it's for I'm the GP or if I'm the a fund manager who's going to fund other people's projects, I like being the capital raiser. And so I've, I've found that that's the dynamic, the position of any sort of real estate business that I enjoy the most. I don't really like the, the hustle of finding deals. I like structuring deals, but I don't like the sales cycle. And so I found that 
my interest is more in, okay, bring me a good deal. Now let's evaluate it. And then I'll figure out if it's something that I want to be a part of. Mm, very cool. And um, obviously when people first start, they have trouble raising capital or buying their first deal, find mm. the money, whether it's your money or someone else's money. So sure. how are you able to overcome, you know, that first year in real estate when you're trying to raise capital? So this was a principle that I learned uh, um, over time. And it's basically, I, re I refer to it as the five pillars of wealth building. And so every sort of value opportunity in the, in the universe needs these five things. So you need some sort of value opportunity vehicle in real estate. That's a deal. If you're a business owner, that's, you know, a, a client. If you're an investor that's going to buy into a business, that's a business you're going to buy. You need some sort of opportunity where you can create value. So in real estate, you're like, okay, I need a deal. I need some deal where I can do a value add or I can, uh, you know, recapitalize it or something, or I can do a, uh, um, a different type of, of management so that I get a higher return. Right. So, or I own a piece of asset that has the potential to appreciate. This is the deal. And then you need time, you need money, you need network, you need knowledge. And if you think about yourself in those five categories, deal flow, value opportunity vehicle, time, money, knowledge, and network, rank yourself on a scale of one to 10 left to right. Uh, if you're relatively new, don't have a lot of experience, your knowledge is probably pretty low, um, but you probably have a lot of time or you may have a lot of time. So what you do is you exchange what you have for what somebody else needs and what, and what they have you need. And so that's why so often in the commercial real estate space, you end up doing partnerships because these deals are too big to take on by yourself. No one person has all the resources of a 10 out of 10 in all five of those scenarios to just do the deal by themselves. In most cases, they, they have partners and you partner with somebody who kind of is a hand in glove environment. So to answer your question, what's happening there is you're like, okay, I want to get into real estate and the market doesn't care if I want to get in real estate, the, the market wants value to be created. So how can I create value? I can go find a deal. I can use my time and energy to help somebody else. I can do a bunch of study and use my network uh, knowledge to help somebody, or I can use access to my own cash or somebody else's in my, in my network's cash to improve or help raise capital for a given deal. So you're using something that you have access to, to parlay into what somebody else needs. Mm, very well said. Yeah. I mean, whether you're in multifamily, whether you're in um, retail, industrial, commercial, real estate is a team sport. Like you said, someone brings value in different ways. Yep. And if you're personally, I think if you're wearing every hat, it's very challenging because not everyone likes every part of real estate. Like no you way. don't like the sales cycle, but if you're the only operator or the only person that's running the deal, you got to handle the whole sales cycle. That's right? right. That's right. So um, very well said. Um. And then for what's your, what's your, um, real estate company's name? Your current company? So, uh, my fund is called uh, one call capital and that's a uh, five or six C uh, fund. So we can openly talk about it. And then my uh, development company is called dirt to curb. What was the development company? Dirt to curb. So we take raw oh, like dirt to curb. land okay. and we get it, um, uh, developed uh, on a horizontal level and then we sell it off to builders. Mm. What markets are you in right now? Dallas, Texas. So we only do the development cycle in Dallas where I have a business partner there and I have a network of people there and we operate in Collin County, which is one of the three or four major counties of the Dallas Fort Worth area. It's like the third fastest growing County in the country and the fastest growing one in Texas. And so we like, that's our acre of diamonds. There's no sense in us going anywhere else. How's that? Is that market still booming or is it slowing it down? Is. No, it's, yeah. it's, um, absolutely booming. Um, similar to Orlando, um, similar, you know, to Dallas, they just have a growing population, Texas and Florida in general, just have a net migration of population and a net migration of, of new companies that are constantly taking, choosing uh, Texas and or Florida to be their, their headquarters. And so that brings jobs and that means they need housing. And so housing is a huge constraint in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And you can just take Dallas, Fort Worth Metroplex and just draw a circle around it. And you can just see it just continuing every year. It just gets a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. In fact, uh, that Metro, the Dallas Fort Worth Metro has now exceeded the Houston Metro as the fourth largest Metro 
area in the country. Why does everyone want to move there? The weather sucks over there. It's hot. You're right. Um, <laughs> but if you, if you follow the money and it's a very business friendly uh, jurisdiction, so True. there's a lot of tax advantages for the businesses. Uh, there's no state income tax. Uh, property taxes are pretty high, uh, but it's just a very friendly area for businesses. And so businesses get tax breaks to come there. And there's lots of uh, people who are looking for jobs and land in is relatively speaking is relatively cheap so they can get uh, their infrastructure in place and they have just this huge pool of, of workers that they can draw and once you once that momentum builds it's kind of hard to to interrupt it because it just kind of it becomes a flywheel and yeah i'm with you um i i live in little rock so i can't really say much because it's just as hot if not hotter than dallas texas um, <laughs> but i wonder why do, why do i live here but it's because it's 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 where i know people and i guess that's for the business cycle it's where it's where the cheap um and friendly um tax implications are <laughs> got it makes sense so if you're in little rock mm -hmm. um how did you develop a network in the dallas fort worth area that's a good question. It wasn't it, it intentionally my plan to do that because I was looking for commercial projects in Arkansas where I do know people, but the market doesn't have that, that buoy effect in the same way that Dallas does. And so I was a part of a mastermind where I developed a very good friend who's from the Dallas area. And he said, you know, I'm looking at doing this thing and you're done this stuff in Little Rock and you know more about like deal structuring and raising money than I do. Would you want to you know, consider we're doing business together? And the more I got to know him, the more we became really good friends. We have children the same age. We have similar uh, values and beliefs and we became pretty good friends. And he has a deep network in Dallas. And so I would go down there and I still do go down there uh, several times um, or I go down there nearly every month, sometimes twice a month. And I'll be there. I'm going there this weekend and I'm going there in, in three weeks. It's just it's just where business tends to happen in this region. And I, you know, the more you get down there, the more you're, you just feel this energy of the place. You know, like this is where we need to be doing business. Very cool. And I'm guessing, I don't know if he says, but your partner lives in Dallas, right? He does. Area? Yeah. He lives in Collin County. Yep. So you got to have someone that's actually in the market, right? If you're going to be investing there, you think? I mean, you don't have to, um, it, uh, in principle, uh, you don't have to have a, a, a general partner in, in the area. Like if, if you're, if you're, uh, like say if you're a limited partner, you could uh, find somebody that knows how to operate all over the place. Uh, but in, in my case, what we're doing is we're actually finding raw land and we're working with engineers and we're working with the lower lo local jurisdictions. And so, yeah, you would need somebody that has boots on the ground because we go to, yeah. uh, you know, um, these meetings, uh, you know, these city council meetings and stuff. So like not, not being there would be a problem a lot of times. How long does it take you from finding the land, buying it, to permits to be shovel ready? Great question. If we knew what we were doing and did it right, it would take us six to nine months, potentially as, as little as three months if we were in the right situation. Three um, months? Have, yeah, you. that's the ideal situation. That's wow. if you're in the county, you already know what you're going to do and everything's perfect. Um, that's not the way it really <laughs> shakes out. It's usually the six to nine month process with the local county, if you're going in the county, which is what we're doing. And then if you're doing, dealing with the cities, you know, who knows, it can just be, it can be 18 months if you're dealing with the city. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, not always, right? It's not always, it just depends on the local city and what you want to have done. If it's already zoned the way you want it, it probably isn't that hard. Uh, what we're usually doing is we're switching from ag to some sort of multifamily zoning. And there's a little more uh, work involved with that. And a lot of times we're trying to solve for some sort of, um, you know, the utilities usually aren't there. So we're usually having to figure out how we're going to get sewer or if we're going to use septic or whatnot. And that, and that process can take long because you have to go through the, um, the local or the, the, the TCEQ, which is the Texas, uh, water quality body, and they can take 12 months. What's the vacancy factor where you're building? Good question. Uh, quite low. I don't know the exact numbers off my head, but, um, it's, you know, certainly single digits it's, you know, vacancy is, I, I'm, I don't know the exact number, so I'm not, I'm not gonna try and quote an exact number, but it's super low. Vacancy really isn't a problem. If there is a vacancy, it's usually based on your management problems and not like the demand or limited demand for the, for the supply, because there's a huge demand with not enough supply. 
are you building like more like in the suburbs, like more like in the inner city area? Good question. Yeah, we, we are building in the hinterland of the metro. So we're taking farmland that is in the path of progress. And mm. so a city will be like two to 5,000 people right now with the forecast of it being like 30,000 in the next five years. Oh, wow. So you go like in the outskirts where it's still like rural and kind of yep. low populated. Yeah. And you kind of um, drive out there and you're like, why are we building apartments out here? And then you'll make this turn. And all of a sudden there's this huge DR Horton development that has 300 houses in it. I'm like, oh, okay. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the market data shows that you're going to be you're going to do well because right. obviously but, that must be a little scary because if it there's is. nothing out there yet, you're like, what, what are we doing putting money? Here? Yes, very much. It feels that way. And, and we talk to people I'm like, well, why are you way out there? And it's like, well, have you, have you been out here recently? And I'm like, well, no, I haven't. It's like drive out here and they drive out there and they go, Oh, I, I got you. Because you drive through farmland and suddenly there's this bustling city that's just popped up like mushrooms overnight. It's crazy. Is there a reason why you don't, um, look for like land and already more like developed areas, maybe like a, a single family home, like a large lot or something like that. Like in the I, inner city. I would city. be open for that. If we find them, they just tend to be very expensive. The sellers um, know it. what they have and they're, you know, they, they, they don't just give that away. Whereas when you're buying farmland, you're buying it for farmland rates, but you then develop it into development value. And does rezoning that to multifamily, does that, is that what takes a long time is the rezoning process? Yeah, the rezoning, and it depends on if you go through the county or through the local city. So if you're in what they call in Texas, they call it the ETJ, the extraterritorial jurisdiction, that you don't have to go through the city. You can just go through the county, uh, and it's kind of an easy process. It's just slow. The county just doesn't, they're not in any hurry about anything. I mean, they're, they're not ready for development, so they're, they don't, they don't, I mean, it's the fastest growing county in the country, and they just can't keep up with, with the request, basically. Interesting. And are you building and then holding or building and then selling? We decide on a per case basis. And so far we've, we've sold and we would like to keep some of these assets, but we're relatively new at this. So we're still learning the, the process. Like we're still trying to figure out what our, our, our niche is uh, because, you know, do you design the the footprint for a builder that's going to buy it from you or do you design it for like a build to rent scenario where you you're going to be the the property owner and you're going to be renting it and we've debated that point quite a bit and so far we've decided to take the sure bet and and, and sell it off to a builder who knows exactly so so we have a letter of intent for the project that we're working on so we know that we have an exit in place and I just really like that surety right now when interest rates are high, higher than we're used to. And we're still in the scheme of things fairly new at this business. We, we like the sure bet right now. Mm. How many um, products do you have going right now? We just have the one project right now um, that we have the LOIs on. And um, it's uh, nerve wracking as I'll get out because we're having to write big checks. And you know, we're, we have uh, land that's a, a adjacent to it. Uh, under contract subject to this first deal going the way we planned and getting the, the, the entitlement like we want. And so it's just kind of a, um, I don't know, uh, development is a very funny business that if you play your cards right, you can make some really, really big money. And if you don't play them right, you can get your, get, get yourself out of your skis real, real quick. So we're, we're playing it super safe. Got it. That's, that's good. Yeah, I mean, de development is definitely a risky business, but definitely big rewards for sure. Right, right. And your fund invests in um, existing multifamily or is it um, also development? So, so good question. It's a little bit different. So I have another business partner on the fund. And on the fund, what we do is we, we basically just uh, offer investors a 12% return. And then we split anything beyond that 50, 50. So the 12% pref, and then uh, we do a 50% interest carry. Um, and what that business model is, is we issue loans to uh, land developers or land flippers. Oh, so okay. the whole model that we do is that any loan that we do has to be a six month or less exit. Uh, we have no interest in 
hanging on to a piece of land or being a part of a long project with entitlement risk. We don't want any of that. We are looking for someone who has an exit plan already in place and all they need is cash short term to be able to basically just, just flip the land. Got it. Got it. So that's, that's a debt business then. Okay. It's totally a debt business. Yep. And what interest rate, if I was looking for a loan from you and I had a six month, a six month exit plan, what kind of interest rate would you be quoting me right now? 18% and as high as fees as we can get away with. <laughs> so we're expensive. <laughs> we're super expensive. And we are your, your last line of defense. If you have your own cash, you're going to use your own cash. And what happens is these land flippers and these um, construction companies, uh, developers, uh, they, they get these, these kind of short term scenarios that come up where they're just about to finish a project and they have two months left, but their, their current loan is, is due and they have an LOI from a builder and they need another two months. And so we'll come in and step in, step in and be a very expensive lender in that situation. And then we'll, if it's a land uh, flipper who um, is just buying some land, they're going to carve it up and sell off, you know, 10 acre plots or something. Um, then we'll do that. And it has to be a, uh, you know, six month or less exit. We do no more than 50% loan to value and we're expensive, but it's a slam dunk option for them. And we are cheaper than doing a JV deal, which is what happens to most land flippers is they end up having to JV with somebody who then ha or demands 50% of the profit. And we don't do that. We're cheaper than JV, but we're more expensive than what you consider traditional debt. Got it. Got it. So I'm guessing at that interest rate, most of your loans are probably in second position, I'm guessing, right? No, these are first position loans. Um, oh, we, wow. We, I mean, these are smaller loans. So we're, what we're doing is these are like, uh, I mean, they're, they're buying recreational land that they're going to then turn into some plots for someone to build their house on. And, and it's, it's those kind of projects. And so we're doing a hundred thousand dollar loan and the property's worth 250 grand and, and they're going to be in it for three months. So that's the kind of situation that, that's happening, but they are just out of cash. If they had their own cash, they would do it, but they had this huge upside. If they just had enough cash, they'd take it down. So that's where we step in. Got it. Got it. Interesting. That's a great business. I have a partner who runs that kind of business. Really? His rates are, his rates are a little lower, but he's, mm -hmm. he's doing really good. So that's a, that's a good business. What business do you think takes up more of your time, the development or the, the debt side of the business? Definitely the debt side. The development is uh, mostly um, cutting checks to engineers and having meeting with an engineer saying, yep, um, do, do that part again. You know, because I mean, we do a project at a time. We're, we're not like a full-time developer that has 15 projects going on. Um, my, m the lion's share of my real estate time is spent on the debt business, just evaluating deals. And we have a loan committee meeting like a bank would, and all three of us have to approve it. And then I send wires. And that's, that's why I spend most of my time doing now. Got it. If someone watching the show wants to do what you did and branch out from their corporate career, because maybe they want to take that vacation mm -hmm. with their kids and they're sick of reporting to a boss and they're sick of HR and all that stuff. Um, you know, what would you tell that person watching the show? Uh, you need to find a reason why what you're doing right now is so miserable. You can't stand it anymore. And what are you willing to struggle for? So that to replace the, the current uh, time that you're spending at work. So it's really easy to get uh, accustomed to the consistent paycheck. And it's usually not bad enough that most people are not willing to make the sacrifice it takes to do something else to replace that income. Because that is not an easy task just to replace your income. Like you need to go find something while you're still working. You basically got to change the tires while you're in the race and you need to re get something else that is providing your income instead of your job. And at some point you do that long enough and you realize I, I, don't, know, I don't have enough time. And if I spent all of my time on the business that I care about and I'm willing to put the struggle in over there, then I can quit doing this job that I'm not rewarded in anymore. And it's a, I, I like to think of it that way. Instead of trying to sell this amazing outcome, this uh, wealth and fame or free, you know, uh, freedom and all these uh, upsides that come with that, with that have the potential of getting uh, being a business owner. To, you're familiar with this, like to running a business is a lot of work and you got to be willing to do the hard thing it takes to get the outcome that you want. And until you're willing to do that hard work over and above the dissatisfaction you have your job, 
you're not ready yet. Couldn't have said it better. That was a perfect answer. I think you got to be in, you got to pinpoint like the pain you're feeling and yeah. say, Hey, what, you know, how, how do I change this? So is it bad that enough? was a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yours was that moment where you couldn't, you know, your, your kids were ready to take a longer vacation. Your wife was ready. She had nothing going on, but you made that yep. phone call and that's what caused you to have to take that 10 hour drive right. home early. Yeah. And I'm, and, and thank goodness he did because, um, like how long would I have, you know, been, been the, the frog in, in, in the boiling water before I realized that I was, it was too late. Right. Um, and I think we all find ourselves in those situations. And so the reason I have this concept of the wake up call is we're all going to get some sort of surprise in our life that we didn't expect. We're going to have a family concern. We're going to have a health issue. We're going to have somebody, you know, you know, very close to us pass away. We're going to be laid out from our job. Something in our life is going to give you a wake up call, whether you like it or not. I would just like for you to consider doing that now, instead of waiting for this bad thing to happen, cast your vision forward and realize, am I really prepared for when I get laid off in two years from now? Or, or am I prepared for, uh, you know, some tragedy in your life where you're not able to work for six months or, you know, there's a tragic death in your family and you just don't have the mental capacity to, to spend time at work and it threatens your career. Prepare for those alternatives now and go and find something that you can own equity in so that you can be a business owner and not a business operator or an employee. Amazing. Paul, how can the listener connect with you or learn more about you if they enjoyed the episode? You bet. The best way to find me is on my website, pauldavidthompson.com. Spelled about the way you'd expect those common names to be spelled. Uh, I have a curse of a common name, so I use all three of them. pauldavidthompson.com. And I'm also on social with a similar handle, Paul David Thompson. Awesome. Paul, thank you so much for the interview. It was a fantastic time. And thanks for all the value you provided to our audience today. <laughs>